Thank you all for joining us this evening. Now that everyone has joined us and have uh, jumped on, we'd like to, like I said, thank everyone for wishing my dad a happy 75th birthday, <laughs> which is a major milestone. So everyone give him a round of applause. We can see you clapping. <laughs> Can't hear you, but we can see you. <laughs> all right, so this is our first time doing something like this, so uh, we may encounter a few technical difficulties. <laughs> so bear with us if we do. But as many of you know, my parents, Damani and Ife Keen, have written and published a book entitled Clandestine, The Times and Secret Life of Mariah O.T. Reddick. Yeah. This incredible work is based on true historical family events back in the 1800s. My dad was always interested in digging into our family history. So once he retired from Howard University, he and my mother had a lot of free time on their hands <laughs> and they decided to put it to good use. They began researching our family history in depth. And I know a lot of you on this call remember, uh, you know, Roots by Alex Haley, you know, back in the seventies. It was originally a book and became an award-winning television series. Some of you on this call may not remember that. You're probably way too young. <laughs> Some of you probably weren't even born yet. But back then, I was probably, I wasn't even a teenager yet, probably going on, you know, 12, 13 years old, maybe. And I just remember how impactful that book and that show, the television show was on my generation and the generations thereafter. So, but my dad actually began his research um, on his father's side of the family um, with the roots in Jamaica, as well as Panama, where my mother and father are residing now. But it wasn't until he started digging into his mother's side of the family is when he came across the name Mariah. And that name Mariah emerged at that point. So he continued his research and he wasn't finding much information. And one day on a whim, he just decided to Google his great grandmother, Mariah Ochi Reddick. And to his surprise, there was a wealth of information regarding her and her history in Franklin, Tennessee. And that really surprised him because, you know, this was 1800. So he didn't think anything would be on Google about somebody from, you know, back in the 1800s. So there was history on how she had been enslaved and she was just basically a figure in Franklin, Tennessee area. So that began the journey. My parents took a trip to Franklin, Tennessee in 2014 and were amazed at all the attention that dad's great grandmother Mariah, my great great grandmother garnered and all the history surrounding her, including being a spy for the union defying Confederate majors with her wit and helping other enslaved people escape. Her name was on several plaques throughout the city. The plantation where she was enslaved is now a museum and the quarters in which she slept is still erected to this day. And it's adjacent to the big slave owner's house. There are billboards on buildings in Franklin that contain her picture and her importance to Franklin's history. But it was when they visited the cemetery, Toussaint Louverture Cemetery in Franklin, where she and her husband and many of our other ancestors are buried, is when it hit my dad that Mariah's story must be told. Thus birthing the book, Clandestine, The Times and Secret Life of Mariah O.T. Reddick. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the trailer for the book.
right. So let's see uh, what do you think. Let's see you. All right. There you go. All right. So that is the official trailer for the book. The Times of Secret Life of Mariah O.T. Reddick. So now I'd like to turn it over to the authors of this incredible piece of work. Damani, a.k.a. William, a.k.a. Bill King, and Ife, a.k.a. Ifatayo, Carol A. King. And they have a very big announcement for you all. So let's give them a big hand and welcome them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We are so excited. I'm telling you the truth. We're just so excited about this. Um, the big announcement uh, for now is uh, to be said in about a few seconds. But first of all, uh, I see so many familiar faces. Yeah. It just uh, I can't go through all the lists, y'all. Some of y'all know me for 50 years and more. It's just amazing. So I know both of us. So listen, we told y'all in some of the messages you got, we asked the question, have Black lives ever mattered? And uh, our book, Clandestine, explores that question because most certainly, Black lives mattered to the people who were living those lives and uh, those who loved them. So yes, black lives have always mattered. They haven't always mattered to everybody, but they certainly matter to us. So our book is designed, and we're gonna read a little bit of it later that gives a little bit of an example in a slightly different way about black lives mattering. So listen, the big announcement, it's not a very well kept secret, but the big announcement <laughs> is we published Clandestine as an ebook in September. It's hard to believe as a year ago. Mm -hmm. We appreciate all the support that we got. Uh, people on here uh, are people who uh, contributed to our crowdfunding helped us to offset our expenses for research and so on. But listen, the big announcement is, need drum roll, drum roll. <laughs> the big announcement is <laughs> clandestine is available now on amazon.com. How about that, y'all? There's a paperback. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a paperback on amazon.com. And, uh, just so you know, we're not joking. Here it is. Can everybody see that? Amazon.com. If you have any trouble finding it, just look, search for clandestine keen and that will get it for you. But we're going to make it even easier. You can go to our website, clandestine-life.com and the link is right there for clandestine. So it's a labor, been a labor of love and uh, uh, we've given birth again. So, <laughs> so, so that's it. The other big announcement, and we've already said it, is Damani's 75th birthday. I've known her for more than two thirds of my life. Yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's great. <laughs> okay. All right, so All I'll right. continue here. So back in February of 2018, my sister Quay, um, my brother Malik, my son Kay, and I all visited Franklin to attend the African American Heritage Society of Williamson County's annual Black Tie Affair, where my parents actually received the Preservation Award for the writing of Clandestine. As you see the plaque there. Yay! All right. <laughs> as, well, as well as to acknowledge the many contribution of dad's late grandfather, which was John Watt Reddick to the Franklin community. So when we made the trip to Franklin and particularly the Carnton plantation where my great great grandmother Mariah was enslaved, it brought about a plethora of emotions within me. You know, like I said earlier with Alex Haley's roots, we've seen the past and how our ancestors were treated back then. But 
when I actually saw the quarters for the slaves where my great grand great great grandmother lived, it made me feel a type of way. Um, okay, <laughs> about to get emotional there. Take your time. <laughs> although although I was happy to learn about my family history, it also made me sad and depressed and candidly angry to actually see the conditions she was forced to live in as an enslaved black woman during that time. Sorry. Take your no time, man. take your time. No apologies. Mm. Okay, I got it, <laughs> all right. So <clears throat> it made me think of the degree of impoverishment, racism and inequality that she endured during those times. And it changed me and my views on a lot of things. We're all still experiencing racism, but what she lived through was on an entirely different level. It was considered property. Just think about this. At the age of 10, she was ripped out of her mother's arms, her embrace, in front of her sister who screamed in horror and she was taken away and never saw her family again. She was given away as a wedding gift later on. So she was treated like a piece of property or like she was a pet, like, like a dog or a cat or a set of silverware, like she wasn't a person. So you can appreciate my anger. Nonetheless, she made the best of her situation like I said earlier, later defied Confederate majors with her wit and became a spy for the Union regardless. All of this is documented in this soon to be best-selling novel, a historical piece of work, Clandestine, The Times and Secret Life of Mariah O.T. Reddick, which will eventually become a docu-series. And like my parents said, is now available on Amazon.com. So now I'd like to turn it over to my son, who was there, and tell us a little bit about your experience there, Kay. Hello. Um, I'm Khalid II, also known as Kay. Sorry if you can't really see me, but... Um, we got you. Yeah, but um, yeah, I was asked to come on here and you know, talk about my experience in Franklin, Tennessee. It was about two years ago when I visited Franklin with my family. And the most memorable part about it was when we visited the plantation where my great, great, great grandmother Mariah grew up on. I remember seeing the house uh, where the owners lived and then looking over to the left, just a few yards away, the dilapidated shack where the slaves had to live. And on that day, it was about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And they kept circling around in my head, like how hard and draining it must have been for the enslaved people to stay in a place like that without any sort of heating. And that they could have just been comfortable, like just a few steps away, but they weren't allowed in. Um, it could have been easy for Mariah to give in to despair when her basic rights as a human were stripped away from her and she was forced to live under these conditions, but she didn't. She held on to hope and she persevered. She accomplished many great things, such as being an abolitionist and freeing many other enslaved people. She was determined to do something meaningful in the seemingly hopeless situation and helped others do that as well. And knowing that her determination runs in my blood inspires me to this day. Very well said, young man. Very well said. All right, so uh, Quay, are you on? Still on Quay? I'm here. Okay, we can hear you. All right. Okay. You talk a little bit about your experience there when we were there. Okay, so after hearing my brother 
and my nephew, I'm just, just bear with me. I'm going to try not to be a snotty mess. Okay. That's okay. I'm just going to start reading. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> my name is Quayley Keen Carson. I'm the proud daughter of Ife and Damani Keen and the very proud great great granddaughter of Mariah. The trip to Carnton Plantation in February 2018 was really a game changer for me. Um, I've always been proud of my family, our heritage, but the feeling of pride that came over me while walking on the land where my great great grandmother had walked and lived and was enslaved was very powerful and very emotional. It reminded me that even with all of the inhumanity and cruelty of slavery, not only was survival possible, not only was survival possible, but thriving and loving and joy and pers persistence were possible. Mariah was an incredible woman. If I take off these glasses, I'm not going to be able to read. Hold on, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, time, sugar. <laughs> <clears throat> Mariah was an incredible woman. And I feel stronger knowing that her blood is flowing through my veins. A woman who was given away, as Khalid was saying, as a human wedding gift. Can you imagine at the age of 10, imagine your 10 year old self being dragged from your family and given away as someone's property. But look at her legacy, y'all. Her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, my daddy, and her great-great-grandchildren like me, living a life that she could have never imagined, I'm sure. Because of her, we are here. And despite all of the challenges, we are thriving. Many of us don't get to learn about our ancestors. I'm so thankful to my dad for doing all of this research I'm thankful that we all got to take that trip to Franklin, Tennessee. And I'm thankful to my parents for creating a historical novel based on some true events that has allowed me to get to know my awesome great great grandmother, Mariah Odie Reddick. Okay, so now, um, like we had mentioned, uh, my parents have been doing the research on this for over 10 years. So this is a culmination of a lot of good research. And right now, Dad, why don't you talk about a little bit of, about how you were looking for the past and finding the future. Okay, so uh, I wasn't really expecting all of this emotion. I guess I should have. Um, I was always curious about um, my family history. And as Khalid said earlier, um, my father's was more of a mystery than my mom's. I knew a little bit about my mom's family. And I'm blessed to have an older cousin who I hope is going to be able to join us named Porter, who had done some initial searching and shared some information. So as Khalid said, I, I, I tried to find, I got cousins here in Panama uh, that are descended from my dad's sister, Aunt Blanche. And I tried to find them. I found some Keens, and we call each other cousins. Uh, but um, we, can't, we can't track it down yet. They haven't done DNA, so we don't know yet. But anyway. Hey, Dad, I just want to let you know that Porter is on the call. Oh, Porter's on here. Great, yeah, great. On. Yeah. So Porter James is my first cousin. His mom and my mom and her sisters. So then, then um, Ife and I got our DNA tested. As a matter of fact, I mailed my DNA sample from Franklin when we were there in whatever year that was, 2018, I think. 
And um, when we got it back, it was great. We got, we were really, you know, most interested in our African ancestry and came up with Benin and, and Nigeria. And this is how we found uh, the brother I mentioned earlier, uh, Victor Ezionata, who's on the call from Nigeria. Uh, he's of that region where our ancestors are from. And he was very helpful, by the way, with the book and uh, some uh, culture of the Igbo people. And, uh, and we found, you know, that we had roots in uh, Mali and Senegal and Ghana, uh, mm -hmm. Central Africa, and, and even a little bit in Southern Africa. So that was great. We were excited, you know, and we we're going to find some more information. But we also got some other surprises uh, because the uh, Ancestry.com uh, gives you the opportunity to connect with people who um, share DNA with you. And lo and behold, we found some other relatives. Yes, we did, happily, <laughs> gratefully, joyfully. In March and in November of 2018, we happily discovered that we are also the grandparents of two more beautiful granddaughters, Brittany Mills and Danielle Newman. And I think both of them are on They're the on. call. They're on. Yep. So, hey, y'all. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey <friend. laughs> uh, they are both the daughters of our oldest son, Khalid, who is the moderator. And we are so grateful through DNA for finding um, our new newfound family. And we are so grateful for the, their presence in our lives now. Our other two grandchildren, beautiful and wonderful, Nandi, who is Quay's daughter, Quay and Reggie's daughter, uh, is at Spelman. She's a senior at Spelman this year. And Khalid's son, Kay, is a sophomore um, at the University of Florida. His mother is Mimi. We're just happy and, and just so tickled to, to have um, these uh, two new members of the family and, and, and their families. So uh, welcome, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dad, now you can um, introduce your cousin Porter since he's on and okay. see, see what he wants to say. OK. Porter, can you hear me? And do you need to be unmuted, maybe? Yeah, I'm looking for him on the list. Porter, can Porter, you unmute yourself? Uh, here, here I am in. There he is. is. Hi, right. Porter. Porter. My wife. Uh, I'm the one waving the hand. <laughs> uh, now, all of you are talking about your connections, your, your connections to Mariah Odie uh, Reddick. Uh, and... Uh, we're talking in rather uh, obscure terms about connections, but uh, I would like to point out to you that uh, she had a son who they named uh, the uh, new senior center housing project after, uh, who was Damani and my uh, grandfather and who, who I, I believe I'm the only living person who knew Papa and called him Papa. And the family name for him was Papa. And if you want to know something more physical about who, how, what Papa looked like, just, just, move your gaze over to Damani <laughs> because there is a physical connection right there. If you want to know who, who, who Papa, who was uh, Mariah's son, uh, looked like, uh, look at that in those pictures. If, if you want to 
want, want an idea about what Mariah herself looked like, uh, then I hope that they, that they will refer to the one photograph that was left at the Carton uh, uh, plantation. At the moment that we visited in, in, in 2014, yeah. the plantation had been turned into a tourist attraction and it had all of these uh, artifacts and, and bu buildings and other things. Uh, the, there in that photograph, that's me in the purple tie and, and my, my wife uh, with the white hair just to the, to the right of me on that picture. Porter, thank you very much. That was just great, man. Thank you so much. So right now we want to turn it over to my sister Quayley as we talk about um, Black Lives Matter. All right. So um, who knew that three words, Black Lives Matter, would lead to so much controversy? You would have thought folks were screaming, Black lives are the best lives, or Black lives are more important than everyone else's life, or Black lives matter more than everyone else's life. But saying the words Black Lives Matter was necessary because the truth is history has shown that Black lives don't matter to some people. So in 2013, hashtag Black Lives Matter, the movement was founded in response to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murderer. I'm gonna be reading straight from the website. So y'all can look this up, blacklivesmatter.com, because there's a lot of lies and confusion about what Black Lives Matter is. So Black Lives Matter was founded in response to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murderer. murderer. Black Lives Matter Foundation is a global organization in the US, the UK and Canada whose mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the state and vigilantes. By combating and countering acts of violence. Y'all hear that? Combating and countering acts of violence. Creating space for black imagination and innovation and centering black joy, we are winning immediate improvements in our lives. So what is Black Lives Matter about? We are expansive. We are a collective of liberators who believe in an inclusive and spacious movement. We also believe that in order to win and bring as many people along with us along, with us along the way, we must move beyond the narrow nationalism that is all too prevalent in Black communities. We must ensure we are building a movement that brings all of us to the front, all of us. We affirm the lives of Black queer and trans folks, disabled folks, undocumented folks, folks with records, women, and all Black lives along the gender spectrum. Our network centers those who have been marginalized within Black liberation movements. We are working for a world where Black lives are no longer systematically targeted for demise. I repeat, we are working for a world where Black lives are no longer systematically targeted for demise. We affirm our humanity, our contributions to this society, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression. The call for Black lives to matter is a rallying cry for all Black lives striving for liberation. So that's straight from the website. That's the background. Mm -hmm. Since 2013, it's become a powerful movement. And although some folks like to twist the facts and say that Black Lives Matter is some kind of terrorist organization, always remember the origins of Black Lives Matter. And always remember that Black lives do matter, mm -hmm. always have, and always will. 
Mm -hmm. Period. <laughs> right. Good job, Quay. Okay, so now we're going to turn it back over to Damani and Ife as they read an excerpt from the book as it relates to Black Lives Matter. So take it away. We're um, reading a part of the book uh, that uh, displays a different angle on the importance of Black lives. There's a lot of um, violence and um, oppression and everything in the book depicting the history as we most of us know it to be. But, but this scene takes it to the personal level and um, it, it'll be pretty self apparent but uh, the one thing I'll say to set this up is that uh, Mariah is working at the Carnton Plantation when the following happens. Mariah rushed into Carnton's sewing room. Miss Carey, Miss Carey, Fanny, my eldest, sent someone to get me. My grandbaby Bessie is sick and I need to go take care of her. But Mariah, I need you to stay. She was already irritated that Mariah had moved away from Carnton. Now this, you can go and take care of her later. No ma'am, she has a bad fever and convulsions. Fever won't break and I need to go right now. Her mom is crying and there's no one else who can help. Oh Mariah, she'll be okay. Mariah responded firmly, Miss Carey, I'll be leaving now. No, no you won't. I won't have it. Mariah, I need you here with me now. We have to prepare for Harriet's 10th birthday party. That is in two days. As Mariah marched from the room, she could hear Carrie's raised voice receiving, raised and receiving voice. Mariah, you come back here right now, right this minute. I said you mustn't go. How dare you turn your back and walk out of my house? Mariah, Mariah. 10 days later, Mariah had not returned to work. Carrie sent word by one of Mariah's relatives who had stayed on to share crop at Carnton. She wanted Mariah to come see her. Calvin helped her write a short note to Carrie saying that she would be at the fledgling AME Church in Franklin on Friday between noon and two in the afternoon, and Carrie was welcome to come if she wanted to talk with her. It, it disgusted John McGavitt that his wife was allowing a negress to set the time and place of a discussion that he couldn't help attend. He had to accompany his wife because it could be dangerous in the immediate aftermath of the war and no one could be sure what the colors might do from one minute to the next. After welcoming the unusual visitors at the door and showing them inside, the church thick-set elderly deacon excused himself as though to escape an imminent indoor lightning storm. Looking askance, Carrie murmured, I had no idea. This mm, very nice. Mariah ignored the rank condescension in Carrie's tone. Our congregation does the best it can. We don't have any stained glass windows or fancy choir rows, but we're proud of it. Hello, Mr. John. I thank you both for coming. If you don't mind, I want to get right to the point. Neither Carrie nor her husband felt comfortable comfortable enough to sit down in the rough young pews of the colored church. Mariah began. For going on 10 years, in my mind, I was a free woman. Seeing their disbelieving reaction, she emphasized, yes, I was a free woman, but the law said, and you treated me like I was not. But we treated you well, and I taught you to read. This is not about you and the kindness you showed me while keeping me in a terrible situation. Would you be grateful if I put you in bondage, took, away, took you away from your mother, but taught you to read? No, this is about a system. Y'all called it the peculiar institution. 
It kept my people from learning to read, took our children from us, and stopped us from going where we wanted to go. But you thought you were being kind, and truthfully, so did I, because I didn't know freedom. You gave me hand-me-down bloomers and gave me scraps off your plate for my children. Oh, Mariah Wimper Carey. I had no idea. And, and just so you are aware, I ain't never wore them bloomers. <laughs> no idea. No idea you felt that way. And I don't like them pig guts either. All them years <laughs> giving us to eat what you would throw away. Carrie was stammering. I, th I thought. You're hiding behind a veil of white innocence. You never thought of it because you couldn't imagine yourself suffering that indignity. If you could have put yourself in my place, it would have been clear as crystal. But Mariah, you know I love you like 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 my sister. Miss yeah. Carey, now wait, now wait a minute. Think about what you're saying. I don't fault you personally because you as a woman had only a limited say in what happened. She looked directly at John McGavin. But you would have not let your sister's children be enslaved or be beaten simply because they wanted to read or speak their mind. John wasn't sure Mariah was still addressing Carrie or talking to him, but Carrie responded, and he was enormously relieved. Well, we, Carrie said slowly, John's relief was fleeting. No, you would not, not even in a nightmare. You would have moved heaven and earth and begged your husband to free them from bondage. Mariah, that is quite enough, interjected McGavitt. Mr. John, in the old days, you had the privilege protected by the law and your whip to tell me to shush. But now I, and only I, will decide when I am through speaking. If you tire of what I say, you can leave anytime you want. You did not afford me that privilege in those days, despite sometimes showing me and my children kindness. Negra, you will not speak to me and my wife like that. The veins in McGavitt's neck bulged. His face, already pink, turned crimson. Like I said, you can leave if and you want to, but I'm free now, free to speak my mind, whether you like it or not. Right. Man, love it, love it. So uh, right now what we're going to do is we're going to get into um, one of the other trailers for the book, which is actually narrated by myself and produced by yours truly and co-produced by my son Khalid. Clint Easton, The Times and Secret Life of Mariah O.T. Reddick is a new and exciting historical novel telling a story of intrigue and adventure centered around a love story. In 1848, Mariah, an enslaved 10-year-old black girl, is ripped from her mother's embrace as her sister screams in horror. Mariah is given away as a wedding gift and taken from Louisiana to Tennessee, never to see her family again. Clasping the amulet her mother fashioned and gave to her for protection and solace, she holds on to it and the African traditions passed down to her, including her secret African name, which means blessing. Mariah, haunted by a childhood betrayal of another enslaved girl, grows into a resistor of bondage and helps others escape slavery. Years later, while working in the household of the Confederacy's president, Jefferson Davis, she becomes a spy for the Union. A wounded Confederate officer catches her clandestinely passing military information to Union sympathizers in the Rebel Army Hospital in 1863 in Montgomery, Alabama. Mariah faces either the gallows or a whipping post, but defies the major when he detains and interrogates her. Her bravery and tenacity are sparked by the stories of her freedom-fighting ancestors, including her grandfather, who was a sharpshooter at African Fort with the Seminoles in Florida. After the U.S. Civil War, Mariah and her true love struggle against KKK violence during the era of Reconstruction while dealing with bitter political conflicts within the family. And they must thwart a traitorous colored blackmailer and abort the deadly plans of the same now badly crippled and deranged ex-Confederate Mariah had defied in the hospital as well as his son, a fanatical deserter, both of whom are sworn to revenge. Mariah tempts fate more than once. 
Her world is one filled with love, danger, spirituality, vengeance, joy, grief, loyalty, devotion, resistance, and resilience. Clandestine, inspired by true events, is the story of Mariah's and her family's struggle for dignity and freedom, as told by her great-grandson Damani Keen and his wife Ife. y'all like that enjoyed it thank you right that was great yes very professional right thank you very much all right so now um well first before my parents do some acknowledgments i'd like to acknowledge um Brittany and danielle's moms letitia and nevada and um i want to thank everyone for being on the call and your support on the book. Make sure you go to Amazon.com. I found it. Purchase copies. <laughs> Not copy, copies. <laughs> Give them out as gifts. Give them away. <laughs> Doing it right now. I'll turn All it over. Right. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you, mom and dad, for the acknowledgments. Well, I just really wanted to say thank you to family, friends, supporters donors, um, everyone, and really wanted to especially acknowledge and thank our editor, Ife Grady. I don't know if she's on, but if she is, thank you, thank you, Ife. So thanks everybody. Um, it's hard to uh, express to you how we really feel about um, all of what has happened and uh, it's been uh, quite a quite a journey, quite a journey. I'm pretty much uh, out of words <laughs> right now, which is very unusual. <laughs> All, right. All right, so uh, now what we'll do is we'll turn it back over to Quay, who's going to read some testimonials. All You're right. There, Quay? Yep. All right. I'm here. I've got three testimonials for Clandestine, The Times and Secret Life of Mariah Odie Reddick. A Saga of Resistance and Resilience. First one is from Vivian Peters, author and educator from New York. This is an important and thoughtfully written book, bringing to life the realities and complexities of the entire era of slavery, of life in the US before, during, and after the Civil War. By focusing on Raya, wow, what a woman, she says, and all she encounters, readers are brought into the history on a deeply personal level. Reading it in today's world with the pandemic and the daily reminders of the social injustices that persist long after the Civil War is important. It is important to remember that even in the darkest hours, it is brave people like Mariah who stand up to injustice and lead societal change. The second testimonial is from Russ Galati, Information Systems Executive from Massachusetts. The book was extremely well done. You have a wonderful ability to take scattered facts and build a terrific story from them. I think if I could meet John Watt Reddick, I would treat him like an old friend. And of course, seeing Mariah would be like meeting a famous movie star, an amazing woman. You must be so proud of what she represents to you and to your family. A spy, a wedding gift, brave, strong, intelligent, an incredible mother, and a great wife with two husbands. My goodness. <laughs> and the last one is from Molefi Kete Asante, who is the chair of African American Studies at Temple University an author of 90 books, including Afrocentricity and the History of Africa. And he says, Clandestine is a sweeping and unwavering fictional narrative that enlists 
all of the characteristic nobility of courageous Africans confronting centuries of oppression and personal agonies. Written with the gift of description and insightful literary nuances, this book represents one of the major novel experiences of our time. Awesome. All right. Um, Dad, you wanted to show the book cover and mm -hmm. acknowledge the artist there, right? Yes. Okay. So we'll let you get into that. All righty. An old friend of ours from Watoto School in Washington, D.C., Achille Ron Anderson, did the color, the very colorful face you see in the center of the cover. As soon as I saw it, I was on his website, as soon as I saw it, I said, we've got to use this for mm -hmm. clandestine. It just evokes so much to me. Uh, motion forward. Um, so when you combine that with the pictures from the 1800s and the early 1900s that are on the cover of the book, it just shows uh, forward movement. And um, so we, we decided to use it. And Kaylee, we thank you so very much for licensing us the use of it for the book. And uh, I'm telling you, y'all, it was it was amazing to hold this book in our hands. This is the the uh, proof copy, <laughs> and uh, it made it real. You know, it, after all of what we've uh, been through to put it together, and the book contains uh, illustrations, very pretty unusual for a historical novel. Uh, this picture here is uh, showing. Um, enslaved Africans who escaped to the Union lines at the war. And the document there on that page was actually written by Mariah uh, Odie at that time, he was, she was Odie. Um, her so-called owner, John McGavick, who wrote to a Confederate general asking for a military escort for his Negroes to be taken from Franklin, Tennessee, which was close to the Union lines, down to Montgomery, Alabama, where they would be safe and would not be seized as contraband. And this is where Mariah ended up working in the household of Jefferson Davis. And uh, family lore is that she was a spy. So we tell that story. And I want to say one other thing. We, um, in writing the book, uh, as a novel, we created a backstory for Mariah. Uh, as so far, even though our DNA shows that we go back to parts of West Africa, we did not know in particular where she came from, but we made her ancestor, her great, her grandmother, an Igbo from that region that is now Eastern Nigeria and part of Benin. And, um, and when we get our DNA back, guess what? <laughs> so uh, it was, that was really something. So uh, we had several people. I mentioned uh, Victor already. We also had uh, Isiji uh, Aguele and Waji Jumino, both from Nigeria, who helped us to uh, be sure that what we were saying was reasonably accurate. 